In this video, we're going to take a look at prediction intervals for linear regression. Essentially, we are going to be creating confidence intervals. So what we've done to this point is we have analyzed our data to ensure that a linear model is appropriate. We've decided whether or not the um, p-value is statistically significant, is the linear relationship significant enough to move forward. And then we found the least squared regression line. And the most recent thing that we've done is then use that to make a prediction. What we want to do now, instead of having just a point estimate, we want to take a look at using an interval, the same type of interval that we've created for all of the other tests that we've done. Now, this can be a little bit intimidating because there's a lot going on. As usual, we're going to let Excel do all of the work, but it's actually a lot of work for us in Excel as well. So on the next slide, I'm going to take you through everything you need to know to be able to find the values that go into this function. And then we're going to pop over to Excel and actually create this function together. And again, once you get it set the first time, you can keep using those same cells over and over, which is what I strongly encourage you to do. Before we pop into Excel and find all of these things that we need to find, I want to actually talk about each of them. And you'll notice that I've created this table for you that's just a really good reference table. And the first column is the symbol. And I want you to notice that some of the symbols, like Y minus Y bar, I'm sorry, Y minus Y hat and SSE, you don't see in the equation, but those are values that we need to find in order to find other values that are in the equation. So I'm going to talk through each of these with you. I have the symbol, I have what it means, and then I have how to find it. So the first one, I'm just moving from left to right in my equation. The first one is y hat, and y hat still means predicted y value. And how do I find it? I plug whatever my given x is into the least squared regression line equation. So we've actually already done that part, is to find the y hat, which is going to be our point estimate. Then we have t of alpha over two, which is our critical value. Remember, it's a two-tailed test, and so I'm going to find the critical value. How do I find the critical value? t inverse two-tail alpha degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom for linear regression is n minus two. Now we go to residuals, which is y minus y hat. So again, not something in our equation, whereas obviously I had y hat in my equation and I had the critical value in my equation. I don't have y minus y hat, and that's because it's just something that I need to calculate in order to find something else. So I'm going to find the residual, which is to subtract the predicted value for each x from the actual value. So y minus y hat, y hat being the predicted value for each x. So not this guy, um, but there's a y hat for each x. So I'm gonna show you how to do that in Excel, but there are several residuals. There is, there is a residual for each and every data point. Then we are going to take that and square it and then add them together. So I'm going to find the sum of squared errors, SSE, and residuals are considered errors, so that's why sum of squared errors makes sense. But they could have easily just as said, they could have just as easily have said sum of squares of the residuals. You get the idea? We're going to take all of these values, we're going to square them, and we're going to add them together. Then I'm going to try to keep my color coding intact here. Then I'm going to find the standard error, which is in fact one of the values. The standard error, which is to essentially take the square root of the sum of squared errors divided by the number of degrees of freedom. So that's why I had to find y minus y hat to find SSE to find my standard error. So now I get to the very crazy square root part of my margin of error. And obviously I'm going to take one plus one over n. n, as always, is the number of pairs. So again, because it's paired data, we're looking at the number of pairs. And so that's going to occur in three different places. 
then we're going to find x bar. x bar is the mean of the x's. So again, it's just an average. That's the same mean as usual. So we're going to take the sum of the x values divided by the total number of values. Then we also need to find, kind of running out of colors here, we need to find the sum of x sub i, which is just the sum of x's. So we're just going to add together all of the x values. That's this one. And then we're going to find the sum of the squares of x's. So I'm going to take each x value and square it and then find the sum. Now, yes, this looks very complicated and it kind of is, but the good news is someone much smarter than you or I has come up with this way to come up with the prediction interval. All we need to do is know how to use it. And so that's what we're going to do. Um, we are going to look at the example that we've already built some knowledge on for constructing, I'm sorry, for the reading level of a child. And remember, we've already found the least squared regression line equation. We have already plugged in 10 to find the predicted value. So we're just going to pick it up from there. So we should have already found this value, which was my y hat, and we're going to continue from there. All right, let's take a look now at this amazing spreadsheet that we have created. So we have already talked through, this is section 10.1 and we've already talked through 10.2. So we already should know how to do all of that. If you don't know how to do that, please go back to those videos because I'm not going to talk through those. So this is section 10.3, and we are going to find a prediction interval. Now, if you'll notice, I've already sort of entered everything in, which I guess, yes, I cheated a little bit, but it's just really easy to make a mistake, and I don't want to try to record this slide 800 times. So I will talk you through everything that I've done. The first thing that I did is remember we were looking at that table and we said, okay, we needed y hat. Well, good for us. We already have y hat right there. Unfortunate for us, the only other value that I have that I will need for this formula is n and the degrees of freedom. So those are the only three things that I have that I already, that I already have that I need. The rest of it I have to find. So that starts by creating these two columns. So if you need to on your spreadsheet, go ahead and create two more columns because we need a column for y hat and we need a column for the residual. So y hat, if you'll recall, was just the predicted value. And it's the same thing that I did here, but this y hat is based specifically on the given value of 10. And these y hats will be based on the given value of whatever's in the x column. So here's how we set that equation up. I want to take, and don't worry about those dollar signs for now, I'll talk you through that. For each of these cells, I want to take the, I'm basically using the slope and the intercept. So I'm saying I want to take the intercept and I want to add the slope times the x value. And I'm going to do that for each of those. Now, if I took this and I started to drag it down, you'll notice that the cell J4 and J5 that have the slope and intercept have now changed to J5 and J6. And I don't want that to happen. So in the beginning, if you may have noticed, I had dollar signs here. The dollar sign on J and the dollar sign on 4 tells Excel, keep the column to J and the cell to 4, keep the column to J and the cell to 5. And now when I take this and I drag it down, it's going to keep J4 and J5, which are the slope and intercept um, cells, but it's still going to change the A value. So this is using A2, this one's using A3, A4, A5, so on. So that's how I got Y hat. Now I need my residual, and remember residual is just Y minus Y hat. And so I'll make that a bigger, a little bit bigger. Y minus Y hat is exactly what it sounds like. I'm going to take the actual Y of 1.3 and I'm going to subtract the predicted Y, which I just found, and I'm going to do that over and over. So again, I can put B2 minus C2, so that's Y minus Y hat, 
and then I can just drag that baby down because I want those values to continue to change to the next cell down. So that's my Y hat and my residual. So if you'll recall from our table, that was the you know Y minus Y hat part that we needed to find. Now I'm going to pop over here and I'm going to start talking through some of these. Now notice I did create an extra column, which I usually don't do, and that is the actual equation that I used, but let's talk through them. Remember we needed to find the sum of squared errors, which just meant take each of these values, residuals, square them, add them together. So I could create another column and square these values, and then at the bottom I could add them all together, but Excel has this handy dandy function that we haven't used yet called sum of squares. And so what it does is exactly what I want it to do. I want it to take the value and I want it to square it and then I want to add them all together. So if I do sum squares of column D, that gives me my um, sum of squared errors. Now remember the standard error of the estimate was found by taking the sum of squared errors and dividing by the degrees of freedom and then taking the square root of that. So that's what I've done here. Oh, is forgot the square root. You can't forget the square root. So the square root of M2, which is my sum of squared errors divided by the degrees of freedom of eight. Now I needed to find the mean of X. So remember, this is just X bar, X bar. And that's just the average of all of the X's. And then I need to find the sum of the X's, which again, I'm taking the sum of column A. And the sum of squares, again, uses that sum of squares function for column A because it's the sum of squares of X. And then, Critical value is the T inverse two tail for alpha. Remember alpha is one of my inputs, comma degrees of freedom. And then the margin of error, oh my gosh, it's so easy to make a mistake on this. So let's talk through this one together. We have the critical value, that's M8. So we have M8 times standard error, that's M3 and then times the square root, and then be super careful with parentheses here, because we want the square root of all of this. So it's the square root of one, so here's where we are, one plus one over n, so one over g4 is one over n, and then plus, and then notice I'm putting this in parentheses, which is the numerator, and the numerator is n times j2 minus m5. So x sub zero is j2, that's my given x value, that's 10. So 10 minus, and then x bar is this 10.5, which is m5. And then I'm squaring that. Then I'm closing the parenthesis because that's the end of the numerator. Then I'm dividing by the denominator, which is again n, so that's this guy here, times, and then this one, remember, is the sum of squares of x's, so that's this guy, m7, and then minus, so notice it's n times that, and then I'm subtracting the sum of x and I'm squaring that. So M6 is the sum of X's and I'm squaring that. And then you take a deep breath and say, amen, because we're done. Now, that is the margin of error. So remember the margin of error is going to be subtracted from the point estimate and added to the point estimate. So what is the point estimate? This guy right here. Remember, this is our observed, or I'm sorry, our predicted value, our Y hat and then we're going to subtract this value that we just found and add it. So that's J7, which is Y hat minus the margin of error and plus the margin of error. So before we're all done, what did we just do? What did we find? How was that helpful? What it's telling us is 
based on an X value of 10 or in context for a child who is 10 years old, we expect the actual reading level with a level of significance of 0 0.05, we expect the actual reading level to be between 3.83 and 5.85. That is what we have found. So instead of just the point estimate, we've now created an interval as we have in all of the other sections. Coming up next, we're going to take a look at confidence intervals for B sub zero and B sub one, which remember those values represent the Y intercept and the slope. And because we're using the capital letters, we're really looking at the population, uh, population slope and the population Y intercept. And the good news is it's a lot easier than what we just did.